mention all these guys that you play with now in Birdland and uh it's a nice one to start off with like uh you know what what's the something else I read it's about something else cannibals record but nah, or nah, something else has nothing, nothing, nothing to do with, to do with that? that okay nah, then not, can not at all. you just let you know, know. In, in fact when I was talking to my manager and I was coming up with names and I said you know I like this name but I don't want to have a problem where they'll say uh, this has to do with the record, something okay. else. And she says, no, I don't think so. And I was like, okay. And, um, and like, for instance, um, it, it yeah, a better, better description of it would be like a, uh, soul jazz review, mm. you know, that that's, that's really, um, best description. And, you know, like, uh, earlier in the sixties and seventies, they used to have these, uh, reviews you like uh, ike and tina turner was a review and they would do all of these uh popular songs of the day and um you know even ones that other people recorded and they would just do them and they would run through these and it was a very popular thing because you'd go and all of your favorite songs would be played so it's kind of like that and um and so we're taking all of these themes um and we've woven them together and um so it's for us it's like super fun you know because you never get to play these kinds of songs and you never play the songs and um and it's interesting for essiot essiot is like you know uh he's on it because he plays electric and acoustic yeah. you know most people don't know because you never hear him on electric but on on this you know he's playing he's playing electric you know he's playing both he's playing uh probably 50 50. really you know? oh man yeah Beautiful. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty significant. So um, it's going to be more fun than anything, you know, and uh, I'm looking forward to it. What will you guys play? Like, I, I don't know, like Bobby Timmons stuff or like... Uh, yeah, there, there is the Bobby Timmons thing in there. Let me, let me pull, I'll pull up the book and I'll give you... Oh, yeah, please. I'm really curious. First set. Uh, okay. Uh... Uh, sorry, you can't see me. All right, like the first set is um, from the bottom, you know, Bobby Timmons, Art Blakey. I'm not so sure, Cedar Walton. Oh, wow, beautiful. Um, hang on, let me get to the next one. Gibraltar, which is Stanley Turn team. Yeah. Um, then one of my songs, The Sun Will Rise Again. Oh, yeah, I love this one. Yeah. Then uh, Filthy McNasty, which is Horace Silver. Along came Betty, but the arrangement is the Benny Gold is um is the uh, Quincy Jones arrangement. I don't know if you know that. No, There's a no, I have to check it out. Oh, it's great, and um, uh, you know, it's obviously Along Came Betty, but it has yeah. a very different feeling and take on it. So we do that arrangement. Uh, Westchester Lady, which is a Bob James tune. Mm, yeah. Uh, Weekend in L.A. George Benson. Sure. Okay. Chicken, which is Pee Wee <laughs> Yeah, that's you know. a nice one. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, no. I, you know, a lot of people don't know. You know, that's recorded by James Brown. <laughs> it's gonna be a party. Yeah, and then the next set is Drifting, which is Herbie Hancock. Feeling good, um, feeling good. Uh, kind of like uh, again, uh, Stanley Turrentine. Ah, then we have. Then we have Cyclops, which is a, uh, I got to check if that's Cannonball or if it's Nat Adderley composition. Mm -hmm. You don't even know Cyclops, do you? No, shit. Uh, I, I feel bad now. <laughs> no, 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 no. Nobody knows it. Then First Light, Freddie Hubbard. Oh, Hubbard, yeah, sure. Skydive. Cold Duck Time. Um, Affirmation, which is from the George Benson record. Um and then the groove, the groove, the groove is, um, uh, it was, you know, it was a hit 
in the 70s and i can't remember the guy's name that did the groove but um it was like uh as soon as we played it of course essie knew it sure. um jonathan knew it dave kikoski didn't even have to look at the music you know it's like they all know it you know so all of these tunes so you might not know it but they know it you know yeah so these um these are just important themes to us you know when we were growing up um you know like uh, of course we listen to um uh the most hard hard of hardcore straight ahead stuff but this was also a part of um uh, of our upbringing as well musical mm -hmm. upbringing. Sure. and so that's what it is and it's nothing to do with the 1958 cannonball record oh, okay. okay and i and i really hate that they put that as description i rewrote another description and, and emailed it to them because it's just not correct you know it's just like uh you know then it's like uh people want to associate oh vince is oh it's a cannonball thing no it's not you know nothing to do with that so yeah, yeah. um you know well beautiful uh, yeah should, should there's gonna be a stream also right i think Berlin has a stream or i believe so yeah. um they should have a stream uh one of the days at least yeah. you know yeah Oh, beautiful. Yeah. Okay. Good that we cleared that up, that it's not the cannonball thing. <laughs> I was like, okay. Yeah. Yeah. But, but uh, you know, you, you mentioned the sun will rise again. I love the tune that you wrote. And uh, Me too. Yeah. <laughs> How do you, you know, you've wrote so much music, you know, since the late 80s already or even earlier. And how do you start? Well, I, got with a lot, with I have a like lot this? of stuff, a lot yeah. of stuff not recorded, but but yeah i have uh quite quite some tunes you know? how did you write that one the sun would rise again you know the original title was die trump die in the record company record comes in no 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 you can't, yeah, can't do okay. it so um how did i write it i was working with a student um it was kind of a casual lesson and she was working on writing a um a contrafax on the song confirmation and so you know i kept telling her okay do this do this and then i said okay well look how about this line and i kept giving her too many lines i said you know what i'm sorry <laughs> you know so um she did contribute a little bit and um so i you know we split it as co-composers Mm -hmm. But that's how it how it it was originally a lesson with a student that that got a little too much input from myself, and so um, it actually has two titles. Uh, one is uh, Rocky. Rocky is a friend of ours, and um, he happened to be visiting New York at the time, and so to distinguish it, you know. She she has it. She calls it Rocky, and I and I um, couldn't use Die Trump Die, so I changed that to uh, The Sun Will Rise Again. Oh, it's like a, such a beautiful melody, and you know, I mean, all these all t tunes like when I listen to Preaching to the Choir, it's like it's this. I don't know when I listen to your tunes, even like the early stuff, Elation, and I don't know the Cookie. That your first album, I love I love that music. Like the it's about the melody. It's like what do you play uh, i play guitar play guitar okay nice nice yeah. okay yeah. do you know paul bowling back oh man we've done this talk paul is one of my heroes oh yeah I love yeah paul, that. paul is one of my heroes also great great musician anyway and for him playing those tunes how fun is it to play affirmation on a gig come on man you know yeah. so it's gonna be stanley Turrentine stuff i mean yeah. grand grand green played that you know some of those tunes sure too. Yeah. And, and in this case, I, I kind of wish I was playing tenor, but I'm playing alto, which I, of course, I, you know, love to play alto. But uh, just to play through those, some of those tunes on the tenor would be fun, too, you know. Maybe yeah. we'll switch at some point, I don't know. That was beautiful, yeah. Now, but I wanted to ask you about your, your writing. How do you usually start? Does it come with you like this, like during a lesson or like, I don't know, doing something? Or do you sit down and say like, okay, I'm going to write a ballad or all the above and um and i'll tell you what happens is 
unfortunately, it's usually when I'm under the gun <laughs> and I have to write something, you know. And so um, I had a situation on my last record. I, I think I wrote two songs on my last record and it was like, pff, it was like last minute stuff, but they were, it was stuff I had been messing around with and I, and I came up with some nice little thing that I enjoyed, you know, like the preaching to the choir. Damn, I should have included that on this. I've got to, on the next one. Thanks for reminding me. Um, that and then uh, the other song that, it, that the record opens up with. And I wrote those pretty quickly. And, um, you know, it's always different. Sometimes I'm like the first song, uh, what's it called? I uh, uh, can't remember the name of it. But I, I wrote that one because I had just been playing some chords mm. at the piano. And then uh, the melody just came to me and then I was singing the melody while I was playing it. And then I put it all together. Mm. And then preaching to the choir, preaching to the choir just like, man, I just like played it on the saxophone. And um, then I said, oh, I can't do another tune in F. So I moved it to F sharp. And um, cause once you, you know, move it to F sharp, it's, it yeah. makes, it just gets you out of that automatic pilot and makes you- Yeah, comfort zone you know, kind of. Yeah, yeah makes yeah. you put a lot more effort in it and uh, just has a different vibe about it. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah, I, I like that. Do, do you have like a, a book of like, or like, you know, notes of melodies and that you still develop or? Yeah, yeah? of course. Yeah. Um, let me see. I have. Uh, you talking about just of my tunes? Yeah, yeah. You know, like the the, the stuff that you don't finish. Like if you kind of go back to them, then and. Uh... Oh yeah. Ooh. Yeah, I, I have that. Not as organized as I would like, but I definitely have it. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So. But, uh, you know, you mentioned all these tunes that you're going to play now on this. Oh, yeah. No, that's that's an organized. Uh, <laughs> and of course, that's wow. all organized. Yeah, very much so. But you mentioned all these names, you know, and uh, I mean, many you played with, you know, Cedar you played with and art you played with and uh but uh and you listened obviously to all this music like what got you excited if we go just a little bit back like i don't know late 70s that you said like you i want to play the horn and jazz like you remember that no, i'm just you know like sometimes you know especially now um i end up listening to some of that stuff uh often hmm. um in the car or at home and part of the reason is because jazz radio is just driving me crazy these days. Um, it's not as good as it used to be. Yeah. Uh, and so um, I find myself listening to pre-recorded stuff and then I'll reinvestigate some things that I really enjoyed. And, um, you know, so, I, you know, it's a part of what I listen to at times. Yeah. As, you know, there are other things I listen to that, you know, I don't record or anything of that nature, but, you know, I try to have a wide spectrum of stuff that I listen to. So it contributes to me uh, musically. You know, I, I believe in being uh, um, uh, versatile yeah. as a musician. And I used to study with a guy named Phil Woods and Phil Woods had so much versatile versatility in his playing. And I'll give you an example on something. Um, Let's say um, we'll pick Lou Donaldson. Okay. Lou Donaldson, who's a great, great okay. bebop saxophone player, iconic, did all kind of stuff. But there's and and actually Lou's Lou does have a little versatility in his playing. Uh, so let me pick somebody else. I'll pick Charles McPherson. Okay, Charles McPherson, who I love, yeah. one of the best saxophone players, and 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 unquestionably uh, one of the best. Um, uh, bebop players even though he wouldn't want to be called a bebop jazz player but whatever um no question doesn't matter if i like him or not he's unquestionably one of the best and um but there's there's a lack of versatility 
Now you think about that Billy Joel solo that Phil Woods takes on I Love You Just The Way You Are. Mm -hmm. Could you imagine Charles McPherson doing that solo? Yeah. I know what you mean. I'm just, I'm just, no, I'm, no, just no, no, no. I'm just saying, and it's no, and it's no disrespect to Charles McPherson. It's just, you know, absorbing. So you know, Phil absorbed so much uh, things around him. You know what I mean? And he changed nothing about his playing for that solo. Absolutely nothing. And um, and that's how he was. You know, and and I really picked up a lot of that, you know, uh, through osmosis. And, um, you know, some players are like that. They have that yeah. versatility. Freddie Hubbard. <sighs> Freddie Hubbard was so so amazingly versatile in his playing. It's like you could hear him on anything. He just sounded great. Yeah. Yeah. Certain people, you know, didn't have that versatility. And it's no disrespect to them because they're still great players. Sure. But it's just a different kind of thing, you know. Yeah. So. What about you? You like regarding jazz? You know, was there an album that really inspired you to play? Started playing jazz, or like? Well, in different times of my life, different things uh, meant more to me. Like, for instance, uh, growing up, uh, my musical diet was very uh, alto oriented, mm -hmm. saxophone oriented, etc. But, you know, these days and for the last 30 years, um, what stimulates me more, interests me more is great, great solos, great interplay, great ensemble, um, just great playing. And that can come from any instrument. So if I were to say who my f absolute favorite player was, would it be McCoy Tyner? Would it be Freddie Hubbard? That's before you even get to a saxophone player. And so that's coming from a position of improvisation more than it is coming from anything else. You know, okay. it's just, uh, I just enjoy uh, great improvisation that's uh, uh, full of logic and, um, and emotion. And it's just, uh, you know, special. Yeah. So Freddie Hubbard has that and and um just everything he plays phil woods had that uh mccoy tyner is not really versatile but he somehow makes it work you know because mm. there are some uh, uh i forget what the recordings are i think he played with ike and tina turner what? McCoy, really <laughs> i kid you not really you know, <laughs> yeah i'm pretty sure i read that somewhere um yeah i, I gotta double check that um, you know, like after he left um, Coltrane, uh, you know, that's like the peak of jazz. Yeah. You're doing so great, right? And he's driving a taxi, man. And he was doing unusual gigs. And I'm pretty sure I can Tina Turner was one of the gigs that he did for a while. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. It's just jazz, jazz, jazz history, you know, and um, and a lot of these kids don't don't realize all of this stuff. But uh, uh, yeah, so interesting. Yeah. <laughs> But speaking of, of jazz history, I, you, you know, Sweet I, put this, I put this shirt on ju just because of you. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I know you played with Nat Adderley so much in that club, but I, I just wanted to go a step back. Like when, when I talk to musicians, let's say your generation, you were probably one of the last generations that really got to experience to play with the masters, you know, with the yeah. creators like but how was it for you like when you came to new york like this early 80s you know the the vibe and the scene like well it's interesting because um like i teach in a couple schools now mm -hmm. and i have to tell you that the students now are so much better than i was way better i mean it's unbelievable i get students i'm like really oh God, they, they come in as a freshman and uh, and they can already do amazing things. Mm. And so for me, um, I came from a place called Vallejo, California. And even though it wasn't the country per se, um, I didn't have uh, some of the major musical influences right at my fingertips. For instance, if you think of somebody like Kenny Garrett, you know, he comes from Detroit. 
yeah, music sure. all it's, around, yeah. and, his, and his dad plays music. Uh, if you think of somebody like Wallace Roney, music all around, everybody plays, comes from, comes from Philly. It's a different thing, you know. So coming from Vallejo, I didn't have that. You know, it's like people were amazed at me because I could move my fingers, but um, but it's, it's it's a very different different vibe. So now with websites like YouTube, these kids get to experience hearing all of these great masters mm -hmm. and seeing them play, and it's just a different. It's just a different thing, and and like I say, when they come into school, man, they, they they've uh, maybe they've only had a very narrow scope of stuff, but very thorough, very mm -hmm. thorough. And it took me uh, some time to get those things together, and so I was lucky that Nat Adderley liked me on a personal level, mm -hmm. and that there wasn't that much competition around you know i'm mean, sure there were other players that played you know as well or better than me but it was a a package of uh you know just a social package like for instance um when i started working with nat um i sat in with him and and i played yeah i could play a little bit but not all that great and sunny fortune was working with him but he didn't really work that much. He he just had this, you know, he guys that he would call when he had a gig, yeah. and he wouldn't do that many concerts. You know, I'm I'm guessing a dozen concerts a year, if that, not even that, you know. So it was really that's where he was at. And um, Sonny couldn't make a gig in Florida, and he called me and asked me to make the gig. I said, of course, you know. <laughs> I'm, not only did I make the gig, but instead of going back home. He said, man, why don't you come on to my place and hang out a few days? And I said, sure. So I went to his place instead of going right back. And we just became really the best of friends. I mean, um, I mean, the best of friends, man. And there are things that I learned about he and Cannonball that I would never share with anyone. And I'd take it to the grave with me. But, but uh, yeah, we had a great relationship. And, and of course, I was like pestering him. Hey, now, why don't we like do some tours and stuff? You know, he's like, he would laugh and he's like, and, uh, you know, it was it was more like um, his wife said to me, uh, I was a rejuvenating spirit mm. uh, for Nat that, you know, she was really happy that I was getting him off the couch and getting making him do something. And it wasn't anything except for, my love of the mu music, in particular, uh, he and Cannonball. You know, I grew up with yeah. that music, playing it, and I just loved it so much. And having that experience was great. So, I go back to New York, and I've been trying to get the gig with Art Blakey forever. And of course, Kenny Garrity's four years older than me, and you know, I have no prayer. But now he's leaving the gig. Okay, and sure enough, Art hires me for the band great and so i um so we're how doing, did that uh, happen actually huh how did that happen actually yeah so so um so we're we, we're working at sweet basil's for two weeks oh wow right. and i and i call nat afterwards i said yeah i got the gig with art blakey and uh and we're going to europe and such and such a date and he said, what are those dates? I says, you know, whatever it was. He says, no, 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 you're not. I said, yes, I am. I mean, he, he just told me. He said, no, 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 we going to Australia. I was like, so now I'm confronted. <laughs> Art Blakey or Nat Adderley. And when I came to New York, Nat Adderley was not a real gig. You know, I mean, he yeah. did some rare concerts, but he wasn't playing all the time, but Art Blakey was playing all the time, um, a few years removed from the Winton phenomenon. So that was like, yeah. that was a, that was a hot gig, but also musically, I also in, loved Art Blakey as well. And I, you know, and the, um, the messengers, the whole thing of everything about it was, was, uh, uh, important to me, you know, it, it's funny because at that time they were, you know, we were all trying to dress in our very best suits and things. 
And I didn't realize that just a few years before it was all overalls. That's <laughs> true. You know, funny stuff, you know. Uh, so, so anyway, while I was uh, working with Art, he made Frank Lacey the music director. Mm. And I, at that time, I didn't really get along with Frank. I just didn't, he was just a little over the top for me, for my personality. And so I had to make a decision, Art Blakey or Nat Adderley. And I chose to go to Australia with Nat. I didn't wow. officially quit Art Blakey, but that was the decision I made. And I went, and then when I came back, I went to see Art. And at that time he lived, uh, do you know the building where Monica Lewinsky lives in the no, village? No, no. Uh, I forget, I forget, because at first Art used to live on Bleecker Street, but then okay. he moved to this other building. And I forget, maybe it's, maybe it's on Christopher. Okay. I kind of, I kind of the area. It's yeah. this big, giant red building. He used to live in a penthouse there. And so I went up to the penthouse to see him and, uh, and tell him, you know, I was, Mr. Blakey, oh, sorry, you know, but he, and he didn't even look at me. He looked at my girlfriend, what's your name, darling? And then, you know, this was the whole thing. So, um, you know, it was like, uh, I was trying to like walk this thin rail and then it was very clear. I wasn't going to be able to do both gigs and I had to make a decision. So Nat, um, that I, what I didn't realize is Nat was actually starting to like plot and plan try and actually trying to do a tour. And our first tour, Nat Adderley had never done a, did a tour of Europe without Cannonball, Cannonball. Oh, sure. or JJ Johnson. And he had never gone to Europe as a leader. And wow. so when we were, when the, uh, um, Gabby Kleinschmidt was the agent. When she put together the first tour, it was uh, Walter Booker, Jimmy Cobb, Larry Willis, and no one had ever heard of me. She, and so she says, well, they no one's ever heard of him. They're going to need somebody. So Nat added Alvin Batiste on clarinet yeah. to play with us, just to have a, a name that somebody knows. Nobody knows Alvin Batiste. I mean, I, out of respect to him, but it, it was silly that she did that. But that's what what she did, and we made that that first tour. And at that time, everybody was going on tours for really long, so I think it was might have been four or six weeks. Wow! Man. Of course, you know your your friendship uh, grows, and music musical friendship grows, and personal also. So this was for me was my first. Um, you know, major tours. I mean, I had gone to Europe with Lionel Hampton's big band and um, some things, but you know, a gig that I was dying to do, that was Nat Adderley. And, mm. uh, and so I did it for a number of years. And uh, and if there's one regret I have, it's, it's leaving that gig. And one of the reasons, you know, I, got, I kept getting called for so many things. I did a couple gigs with um, Dizzy Gillespie. And yeah, I, I saw some footage. Yeah, I had, I had a chance to go with Dizzy, and but I, everything was was tied up with that. Um, I had a chance to do a lot of other gigs, and and the reason those were so attractive to me at the time is I felt like musically I wanted to play some other things, mm -hmm. and uh, and just I thought it would help me with my personal growth because I was really into practicing and trying to develop as a, as a musician. And I felt that uh, these other experiences were important because I had been with Nat a number of years. And so, um, so I told him I was gonna leave the band and he was really pissed. He was more hurt than he yeah. was pissed. And so one of the things I did, you know, I, I, um, I was started to produce some records for Japanese companies. And, and so I produced a record for Nat, uh, what I was not on, you know. Um, and so when I was leaving the gig, um, you know, I, I hooked him up with this record date. And I said, um, you know, uh, 
you know, everything, all the business stuff is okay. So when we're in the studio doing the recording, he was just hostile to me, you know, <laughs> he was just hostile. You know, I'd be like, uh, uh, Nat, you know, that was a good take, however, blah, blah, blah. And he said, can you hear me? I said, yes. And he go, fuck you or something. You know? oh, like, just, and, and uh, he just, he was just, he was, he, but see what I didn't understand is he was more hurt, hurt yeah. and upset that I left. And um, I was trying to give the, the gig to Mark Gross, who I felt was the best person for the for, for my replacement. And he decided to go with Antonio Hart. Oh yeah. Mark partially because I wanted Mark Gross. <laughs> wow. <laughs> it's that, you know, it's, it's funny how these things happen. And and Antonio is certainly a fine musician okay. and and he did a, a good job uh, playing with Nat as well. But um I just from where I was at that time, and and Mark Gross and Antonio Hart are best of friends, yeah. you know. But I w I really was trying to, um, you know, give the job to uh, Mark Gross, so yeah. uh, it didn't work out that way. And then I went on to do um, a bunch of other things. Uh, Horace Silver, I guess. Man, yeah, that's incredible. No, no, no. Maybe Horace was before. I can't. I can't remember my timeline. It gets all messed up. But um, leaving that job enabled me to do a variety of other jobs. Yeah. And um, what about Freddie? I mean, how, well, you, I was never. I was never in Freddie's band. Oh, okay. So I did some gigs with Freddie. Um, I did a. Oh, this was a good gig. Uh, it was uh, Friends of Pennsylvania Friends of Jazz, and it was uh, Kenny Barron and Ben Riley, oh man, and Cecil McBee, and uh, myself and Freddie Hubbard. And so, now I had a good rapport with Freddie, and and um, you know, I, yeah, I hear used to hear all these horror stories. But yeah, he really, he really liked me. And um, he used to call me all the time and we just talk. So it was really great because he was one of my heroes. And uh, and it's like, man, I can't believe I'm actually friends with Freddie Hubbard. This is crazy, right? So he, he would uh, call me sometimes and talk. But anyway, so we're doing this concert. And the first song we play is In Walked Bud. All right, mm. we're good, right? The second song we play is A Night in Tunisia. You know, there's the break in A Night in Tunisia. And sure enough, you know, I get a really big ovation, right? Keep in mind, on Freddie's worst day, he's still 10 times better than me and everybody else. But, you know, so I get this, uh, you know, huge ovation. You know, Freddie is more moderate. So he says, move your stand back. I was like, what do you mean? He wants me to take my microphone stand so we're not standing equal. So I'm standing like oh, three or four feet back. I was like, come on, Freddie, move your fucking stand back. I was like, okay. <laughs> Just weird stuff. It's like, yeah, crazy, you know? So it's hard to imagine someone so mature as a mm. musician with so much depth could actually have that kind of a shallow take on something like that at that moment but um you know i i don't i don't i don't hold anything against him because you know um this guy was one of the uh, greatest musicians ever I'm walked sure. the planet incredible and so you know he he um carl allen used to play with him and carl was yeah. one of my best friends and and so freddie and carl same thing when when carl left freddie you know <laughs> Like when I left Nat, it was like, you know, the, the hardest thing was the friendship. So uh, Freddie would call me and he said, he said, man, what's that motherfucking Carl Allen up to? I said, call him Freddie, fuck that motherfucker. This was the feeling at the time. And um, so, you know, he would, you know, talk about uh, he was coming back to New York was a, a reoccurring theme, hmm. you know, and he'd ask me, uh, who out there can play, you know, who, who's playing. And I remember telling him about Jeremy Pelt. He said, Jeremy Pelt. I said, yeah, he, man, you won't believe he sounds so much like you. What? 
Are you kidding me? And so uh, when he finally heard Jeremy, he he really um, he really was overjoyed and really mm-hmm. actually pleased to hear him because you know Pelt is um, uh, really uh, tremendous talent. And for Freddie at that time, you know his chops were failing, and so for him to hear someone carrying on mm. um, his voice. I, I can imagine, because I, I can imagine myself, it was impressive to him, you know, so um, um, that was nice. I'm glad he got, had a chance to hear Jeremy before he checked out. And, uh, but, you know, Jeremy's own man, he kept continued to grow yeah. and, mm-hmm. and do his own thing, but, but he definitely has that digested much better than uh, pretty much anyone. Um, at one time, though, Nicholas Payton really was, whoo, he was doing, he was playing a lot of Freddie vocabulary yeah. really incredibly well. Uh, but, you know, the guys move on and, and develop their own voice, which is, uh, of course, what we all try to do. You know, I mean, I start out with, you know, Charlie Parker and Cannonball Adderley. And then, uh, you know, but, you know, you f- try to find your own voice and never lose sight of that. Yeah. And uh, I continue to do that. Yeah, definitely. Finding your own voice. And uh, I mean, I saw you in Europe in Porgy and Bass, like, shit, 15 years ago okay. with, with Wanzi. And, you know, and it's, you sounded amazing back then. And But if we go even back, like, how do you look at the album Scene One and how did that one happen? Uh, like, how did you become decide to become a band leader? You know, what was the impulse? And Right. Um, scene one is a recording that I did not want to do. Really? You know? Oh, wow. Uh, because at that point, uh, you go from like, man, I got to do a record to like understanding um, that you're not ready to do a record, you know. And so I, I had, you know, before I was like yeah, dying to do a record, but then I was like becoming much more aware of everything. And I was like, man, I got to get this together. I need to do this. So by the time scene one came along, uh, the offer from Toshiba EMI, which is a subsidiary of uh, Capital and Blue Note Records. So I wasn't dying to do it, but it was 10 grand to me. Uh, I was just like, uh, I sure <laughs> use the bread. And the Japanese at that time paid in, in cash. Bam, was wow, a man. Yeah, wow. with the band around it and everything, $10,000. Jeez, Christ, man. So that's what it was. And uh, I just couldn't say no, you know, that's what it basically boils down to. So there were still a couple of okay moments on that record, but, and people tell me they enjoy their record. You know, pe- people bring it up to me all the time to sign. And I'm like, yeah, I made another yeah, recording, you know. Um, but it was not, um, uh, not a very polished or, Hmm. Uh, my finest hour or anything. Um, I think American Experience came out after that. And American Experience, while maybe maybe a year later, I'm guessing, I have yeah. no idea, um, it's, a, it's a stronger recording effort. You know, it's, uh, um, it's better for a variety of reasons. Yeah. And so that was, that was a decent that was my real i i, I kind of look at that as my real first record mm. even though it wasn't and um and those next music master records are actually pretty good evidence um, with Marguerite, yeah I, I love that stuff what you did later like well the evidence that's actually landmark records oh yeah okay and uh oren keep news who was of course the producer of cannonball and bill evans and monk and everybody uh oren keep news approached me um to do a record you know and it signed with his company i was like yeah of course you know <laughs> and so um i did those records for oren and um really nice guy great friend of the music and um and so for me that was great yeah. uh, then he sold landmark records to get out of the business 
and Landmark Records was bought up by Joe Fields, who owned Muse Records. Mm, right. And so I had I had a half of a record in the can, but it was incomplete. And Joe was like, oh, it's, we're going to put this out. And I, oh, yeah, I need to go another session. He said, no, no, it's fine. The way to, Joe, no way you can put that out. So that was a, disheartening that they put that record out. It even has like sound check is one song. It's just it's a sound check in the studio. So I was disappointed that 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 record um, came out. You know, I was disappointed. It was an incomplete record, mm. and with um, uh, and so it needed work. So I'm sorry that that one came out. But after that, I had a string of records with um, uh, high not high note with. Uh, um, with Music Masters. And at the time, when Music Masters approached me, I had a choice of going with Blue Note Records mm. or door number two, Music Masters. So on the surface, you're like, oh, surely you're going to go <laughs> with, it, with Blue Note, right? So Blue Note was a three record deal, one record guaranteed two records blue note options mm. and and um they would assign a producer for each of the pro each of them they would have final say of the concept of the recording and this is what it was right and the money the budgets i forget they were comparable to what what music masters mm. offers so music master the deal was same kind of budgets five record guaranteed deal and i said uh are you guys a signer producer he said, hey, if you want one of course to make the fucking record i was like and he's like you'll be the only guy only young guy he says you know we got stanley turn team freddie hubbard mill yeah. jackson cedar walton uh hubert laws you'll be the only young guy and i was like man that's pretty uh, pretty cool right so I decided to go with Music Masters. On at that time, that was really the best decision. Maybe still it's the best decision mm. um, because I I made like the you know my record Joe Beam for Love. Yeah, sir, sir. Oh, sir, it's a great, great record, man. Yeah. I made all, all of these stuff. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I made for Music Masters were like my own concept. You know, basically you send a um, uh, a fax. <laughs> you're requesting <laughs> money and uh and then you describe the project and they'll wire half the money to your account when you finish it drive down the shore jersey shore and bring them the master to give you the other half of the money Man, are you kidding me it was too great and then they also called me to produce a record for uh phoebe snow mm -hmm. you know what phoebe snow is yeah and that that ended up being a disaster, but those opportunities came, you know, through that, yeah, with, with, through the company. Like for instance, uh, with Phoebe Snow, uh, he says, uh, "Do you know who Phoebe Snow is?" Uh, of course, I know who Phoebe Snow is. And then, um, and he says, "How would you feel about producing a record for her?" I was like, "Man, if, if she's into it, I, I would love to do it." So he said, "Let me talk to her." So he talked to her. So gives me her number. I call her up. And uh, said, you know, uh, Mr. Nissim asked me to um, contact you about producing your uh, record. He you says you're going to sign with Music Masters. Yeah, I, I think so. And um, you know, but I, uh, this is what I have in mind: basically a hip hop rap record. And I said, well, <laughs> um, I think they were hoping that you would do something along the lines of poetry, man. That you did with uh you know zoot sam and t carson and stuff nah nah i don't want to do a, do a hip-hop record i've already recorded most of it i said okay well i'm not really the guy for this and uh i'll you know not it's not that won't work for me but i can help you find someone but let me talk to the record company so i call back to a record company and said uh, she wants to do a hip-hop record said, what the fuck? I'm like, just, I'm just telling you. He said, listen, just do the one record for me. It's important. 
And I said, she doesn't want to do it. She says she has half half the stuff recorded and she wants to do a hip hop rap record. He's like, nobody wants to hear her rap. But this is this is what we were com- com- confronted with. Yeah. Um, and uh, this is what we had to had to so bizarre. Like when you tell these things, like how the industry has changed, right? That you actually got paid and you actually. Yeah, the labels could actually pay the budgets for musicians and mm-hmm. everything. And like nowadays, it's like way yeah. different in a way. So yeah, it, yeah you know, like uh, everything is so different. It really is. And for revenue stream, young musicians are creative and they found different ways to make up that lost revenue stream. But for my generation on the course before yeah. it was like you know writing some songs you know got your extra money recording yeah you, know, you know selling cd or lps or whatever um all of this uh ended up being uh you know you could uh, uh sustain yourself and and do well with that but for a new generation like the kids i have uh at school yeah, yeah. yeah. so some of them are, are so so creative and making money i'm like wow you know they they're able to do stuff on the internet and and uh they have unique revenue streams and so so on one hand i'm worried about them uh putting all of their eggs in the basket of music but on the other hand i'm also uh, amazed and astonished by some of the creative things that they do to have a mm-hmm. revenue stream and they're able to somehow book tours. They do these tours making no money, but they do these long tours. I'm like, wow, it's different, man. you know. So yeah, that's yeah. it's incredible. When was your first time in Europe as a band leader? You remember that? Oh, as a leader, yeah. um, I, I I actually had a, probably when the record American Experience came out. Todd Barkin, who owns the club um the keystone corner yep. todd booked a couple tours for me at that time so those tours uh were with dave douglas on trumpet really uh, yeah dave wow. douglas is on american experience yeah yes, but sir. like the t- oh yeah you guys then played of course yeah yeah, yeah. We, we were together in horace silver's band Exactly. <laughs> Although that was a terrible band, and we were both awful, I was worse, and he was awful, and so I was really awful. Um, and then it was a and Horace's band. There was a bass player named Brian Bromberg, who oh, yeah. brought, who yeah. brought his electric during the tour, but he only played upright for Horace's gig. But it was just not a good band, man, you know. But uh, at least at least Dave could 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 maneuver around the harmonies a little bit more than I could, but it was just not a good band. You know, it really wasn't. Um, So anyway, uh, Todd booked my first tour and um, Bruce Barth, Mm. Dave Douglas, uh, James Genus, Mm. and Yaron Israel. Those were my first tours in Europe. And, um, And we had Nice little tours. I forget where we went, but um, I, I can kind of remember some of it. You know, it was nice to be on tour as a leader. Was it easy for you, like from the beginning, being a band leader and like leading a band? And yes, yes. Um, um, uh, you know, working with Nat Adderley, I really observed more than anything, and I really learned a lot okay. from him. Um, and so. Some things came natural to me, and um, most of the stuff I I learned, you know, from that, like all kinds of stuff, you know. Um, like one time we were on a tour, and I forget the money we were supposed to make per week, but it was a long tour, and or not long, it was maybe a month, and. So the first day we go to pick up money on this tour, the guy says, oh, uh, Wimwit was the agent, has already picked it up. And that's like, what? We were supposed to pick that up. So uh, the next day, supposed to pick up some more money. 
He said, Wim's already picked it up. What? And so he calls Wim, and and um, and Wim t- tells him, yeah, we had some problems, and the money that I promised you, we're going to have to pay you a little less. And, of course, Nat went into a rage. Wim hangs up on him. Calls him back. I'm in the room. I'm sitting right there. Wim hangs up on him again. So Nat tells me to call. So I call and um, I said, yeah. And he says, he's yelling at me. I can't, you can't communicate like this. He, you know, he wants to know um, why you propose paying him less. And Nat grabs the phone. God damn it. And he hangs up again, you know. So, so anyway, long story short. Um, I end up talking to Wim, and and so now Nat is confronted. I think, I think we were supposed to get twelve thousand five hundred a week, but he cut it to ten thousand. Mm, wow. So, um, so now Nat's already promised all the musicians a certain salary, and for Nat, um, financially he didn't need the money. It was more. It was almost therapeutic for him. He just mm. loved, loved, and it was great. And, you know, but of course he wanted to be paid. So now he's confronted, talks to your band meeting, go home. And the guys in the band are like, oh, man, I, I need this money, you know. Mm. So, so everybody's in need of money. And so Nat decides to do the tour. And he didn't get paid at all. Oh, wow. But he paid, he paid every everyone exactly what he, he initially told them to do, what he was going to make. So that's a lesson, not one that I wanted to learn, but one that I learned, you know. And um, and then another time, um, you know, it was like, uh, he was like, uh, yeah, come to my room. I got some money for you. I'm like, oh, I can just wait until you know, come, come take fucking money. And so I come to the room. He says, you always pay out because if you get mugged yeah. or you lose the money, you still got to pay the musicians. He said, when you get paid and you pick up money, you pay it out. You know, so I learned lessons like this. And uh, I think it was pretty sure it was Russell Malone had a lot of money on a tour. He was as a leader. He hadn't paid out the band. And he, he, I don't know if he'd lost or if he got mugged or what, the payroll. Oh, fuck. So now you yeah. still got to pay everybody. You know, everybody, listen to everyone. I feel for you. I'm sorry you lost this money. But, but yeah. You know, and so there's important lessons, things like that. In terms of how to deal with the musicians socially, um, this was, you know, some of the, some of the leadership skills I learned um, being in the army <laughs> mm, and, mm. Uh, and, and more subtle things of how, how to disguise things and still um, be um, a member of, of your unit and, and get along with everyone yeah. and personality. Some of that I just learned through doing, you know, uh, but a lot, I learned a lot from Nat Adderley, you know, and other people I worked with, I always um, paid attention, just paid attention and really learned some practical things and um, and observed some don'ts also, some things not to do as well. So this was a big, big help for, to me. You know, it's like yeah. this whole apprenticeship is always how jazz had functioned, you know. Um, you know, you work with Charlie Parker and you're a side man. Now you get a, your little recording opportunity. You've had that experience of working with him. Now you go on. Oh, now you hire this guy, John Coltrane. And now, he, and it goes on and on. And so that was a healthy, a healthy a way of, of the music continuing and growing. Yeah. But now that's lost. Yeah. Now it's like, all right, I just graduated at Juilliard, and now I'm like a record. <laughs> Juilliard sending me on this, and now I'm getting doing a record, and and so a lot of the the personality uh, of the music is lost. However, mm-hmm. 
um, the higher percentage of musicians are much more proficient um, than they were earlier. Yeah. But the soul uh, often of the music is is kind of lost, you know, for whatever reason, you know. And um, I uh, posed a question to Jamie Ambersall. Jamie Ambersall, um, I met him recently, maybe a year ago, mm. and. Uh, and I said to him, I said, you know, kids are much more proficient now, you know, and he agreed, you know, and I said, you know, even, and I was probably this first generation that benefited from your play along recordings, even though that had been done earlier, yeah. Music Minus One, the exact same concept. He basically just did the same concept years later and it, and it worked and made him a multimillionaire. And he's a super nice guy and I like him. Um, but I said, how come considering how much more proficient these young musicians are, how come jazz in the universities has not produced a McCoy Tyner, Freddie Hubbard, Cole Train, Charlie Parker? How come? Not even close. Not even close. Proficient. No yeah. question about it. You know, it like um, uh, I did, uh, I was a preliminary judge uh, for the Monk competition mm -hmm. where I listened to the tape. I was one of three people that listened to tapes and we get it down from 400 down to 20 or something. Right? And the thing that's amazing is the 20 that we picked, you could have thrown them out, taken the next 20 would have made no mm -hmm. difference. Absolutely no drop in talent or anything. I don't even know how we decided that 20 was it because it was really, um, if you take a hundred people, like when I was growing up and when I started, if you take a hundred people, there'd be one special guy, five really gonna be solid players and then steep decline, but yeah. now, five special players, 30 like super solid gonna be good and a slow decline, not steep. Mm. It's it's very different now. Those percentages are very different. And um, and that's a, a good thing. But again, like I asked Jamie Emersaw. Yeah. Where's Coltrane? Where's Charlie Parker? Where's Freddie Hubbard? Where's McCoy Tyner? Yeah. yeah. You know, they, you know, what happens is the um, the record company will say this guy is yeah, this new, level. Yeah. Yeah. It's bullshit. Not even, not even. I mean, like, really? Come on, man. Spare me. You know. Yeah. And um, and so it ends up being a thing of marketing more so than uh, rising through the ranks because you were just ridiculous player like. Um, well, Freddie Hubbard rose through the ranks because he's just a ridiculous player. Yep. You know, Coltrane rose through the ranks through a ridiculous player, man. You know, these guys, uh, uh, Sonny Rollins, these, these, their, their, their career's built on on that apprenticeship. And, um, you know, and they, and they were amazing musicians. But now uh, that's lost and it's doing yep. a dis disservice to, to the music. And I don't know, you know, what the solution is. Your generation had that still, you know, like you said that you could go for a six week European tour with Nat Adderley. That Ooh, all the time. It's all like the time. a two week tour now possible or, you know, it's if, you know. You know, it's interesting because, uh, yeah, it's very different, very different. You know, there's um, that same promoter that shorted Nat on the tour. Uh, years later, I was doing a tour with Cedar Walton or something mm. and he filled in some dates. And uh, I said, now, William, uh, he said, you're not doing jazz so much anymore. He says, nah. I said, what happened? He says, well, jazz musicians, first of all, he says, when I first started doing it, he said, all you have to say is guys from New York, jazz players, club was full. Mm. He says, now it's like, you got to sell it. Um, you know, if it's not the right guy that's getting some publicity, um, then he's dead in the water. You know, you won't do business. Um, he said, 
jazz musicians want a business class ticket. You know, they pout if they don't get it. They want X amount of dollars, you know. And he just ran it down. He's just paying the ass. He says, you know, I'm doing the Chinese circus and blues artists. He said, I hang a sign out, out the door. Blues from New Orleans. Doesn't matter who that's it is. It. Yeah. The club is full. So, you know, he's like, so that's what I'm doing. I was like, can't argue with it. You know, I've, I've, I did tours with, with Kenny Barron where every night the club was full or the venue was mm. full. And then we were in Luxembourg and it was, I don't know if it was a church or a small concert hall. Let's say it was like 300 seater or something. And you walk out and there's like 12 people. Oh, oh shit. shit. Uh, for Kenny yeah. Band. But it happens. Sure. And so, you know, this is like high level tour. And that was a long tour too. Really long tour. I forget. That that might have been a two munner. It was it was pretty wow, long. Man. And, That's uh, crazy. And yeah, and I did a tour with Jack Dijonet. Same thing. Every night we're playing is, is full. And then in Mallorca, we had a concert. And um, and so Jack's like, oh, what, what time should we start? And uh, he Jack's like, you need to let in the people. He said, uh, the doors are open. And, uh, and uh, so it was like, it was a big hall. I'm, I'm going to guess it was 500 seats under 10 people. Shit, man, I just these are yeah. that like fuck. Wow. Uh, yeah, but I'm but every, but the next night you play and it's packed. Oh sure. And the next night, every other night is packed, you know. So, but I'm just saying, you know. So those nights uh, happen. Although I don't remember them happening for Nat Adderley, but maybe, you know, maybe. Um, actually, it did, did happen a little bit, but not much. But we were doing doing well with that band. But this is the nature of the business, and yeah. so. Um, even now, uh, I found myself in need of uh, a piano player for something at the last minute. And the club owner was like, get this guy. I'm like, why? Because he has an internet presence. Get this guy. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, wow. I'm like, if that's what, that's, this is where we are. Yeah, that's bizarre. It's bizarre, really. Yeah. It's, so. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, I hate to be one of these um, getting older guys saying back in the day or the good old days, but yeah. <laughs> so, so it's not something to that. <laughs> You're getting there, right? Yeah.